For those of us who have been through the last two years with COVID-19 in the air, we're asking a lot of new questions, like how has it changed you? How have you pivoted? This show is called Resilience because we have all been through, become adjustable to everything we've been faced with. Our guest today is Professor Heather Lynch. She's an Associate Professor in Ecology and Evolution at Stony Brook. With a Bachelor's Degree in Physics from Princeton, a Master's in Physics from Harvard, and a PhD in Evolutionary Biology from Harvard. In 2016, she and her team dis discovered a previously unknown supercolony of Adelie penguins. And in 2019, she received the Blavatnik Award for Young Scientist. Currently, she's working with her lab and students on developing methods to survey and study how penguins are affected by climate change, fishing, and tourism. Welcome to the show, Professor. Oh, thank you. It's my pleasure. OK, so first and foremost, I wanted to ask you, why did you switch from physics to ecology? Oh, it's a great question, and I wouldn't recommend that anyone else <laughs> do it. Uh, but I, I got into physics because I love the challenge. It always seemed like the hardest thing I could be doing. And, and I, I just wanted to be, you know, uh, really challenging myself. And so I, I went through undergraduate in physics. I went to graduate school for physics. Um, but I had, I had this sort of uh, moment of crisis for me personally. This was in the era where Al Gore was doing his um, Inconvenient Truth uh, series. And mm -hmm. I saw him give a lecture at Harvard. I saw several other uh, talks on climate change, and I felt that there was this struggle, you know, the struggle that would define our generation, and that they needed help. And if I could help in some way, I would. And so I decided to transition from physics to biology, very much so that I could uh, help deal with the environmental changes that we're seeing uh, today, even more so today, and to try and apply some of my mathematical tools to environmental problems, like the problems that I work on today. So going back, would you have started out with biology if you knew that you were going to start in this field, worry about climate change? You know, nothing could do better than my physics undergraduate education. And I, I think that in the end, it actually was the best training that I could have for the work that I do today. Um, physics represents just an incredible uh, way of thinking about the world. And the mathematical tools that I developed, I use to this day now. Um, the, the trauma of having to change disciplines in the middle of graduate school, um, I, I would not wish on my worst enemy. Um, but having come through the other side, I can see the value of having actually started in physics, even though now I study penguins. Yes, why penguins? I, like many, you know, I think um, in many cases, our career choices come down to something as random as who you bump into at a conference. And in this case, I had met a quantitative ecologist at a conference uh, when I was a graduate student who really inspired me, whose own work was on these very difficult problems at the intersection of applied sciences and mathematics, mm -hmm. and I wanted to work for him. And I applied to work in his lab, and at the time he had a number of different projects. But he said to me, you know, I've got this, this new project, I don't know if it, anything will come of it, and it has to do with Antarctic penguins. I, I just came upon this big data set of, of penguin data, and no one knows what to do with it. And, and that was sort of love at first sight for me, not the penguins really, but the data. And I've been working on it ever since. So you're more, more into the data than the, well, you would be still interested in penguins. Do you, do you have a favorite penguin? Um, I have a not favorite penguin, which is actually <laughs> one of the ones that I study the most, which is the Adelie <laughs> penguin. Um, and I find that I have no pictures of Adelie penguins because I don't like them and they kind of creep me out. Uh -huh. um, but among the ones that I study, my favorite would have to be the Gentoo penguin which is the, one of the largest uh, penguins in Antarctica, and uh -huh. it's very graceful. I think that's the way people would describe it. It's, it's quiet, it's elegant, it's graceful. Um, it's not like that, that yappy monster, the Adelie penguin, that uh, takes up so much of my time. Um, but the, the, the gentoo, they're just, they're just lovely. That's great. And um, what have you learned from, the, from studying the penguins? Well, you know, one of the, the big things that we've learned is that being a resilient generalist really pays off, um, particularly with regards to climate change. So in the Antarctic, we have two species that their populations are collapsing in the Antarctic Peninsula region. Um, but we have another species, the Gentoo penguin, mm -hmm. who's really thriving. And so we, we have an opportunity to see what kinds of species will be able to not just survive climate change, 
but thrive under climate change. And that doesn't mean that climate change becomes a good thing, but it does mean that we can start to predict which species will uh, actually um, expand uh, under climate change and which species are in real trouble. So what we've learned is that being a generalist, uh, being able to roll with the punches uh, is exactly the kind of traits that we would want to see in species. And I think there are lessons for us as well. Yeah. Um, do you have some lessons you want to share? Well, I think this idea of, of being resilient and being willing to change your strategy uh -huh. is a really important one. So if we take the Gentoo penguin, why is it so successful? Well, it's very uh, broad in its diet. It will eat fish, but it'll eat krill, it'll eat what's ever around. Mm -hmm. If its nest is lost, it will relay its nest. It will, it will try again, it won't give up. It's very um, flexible in where it breeds. So if new territory opens up, these Gentoo penguins move right in. Um, they are very flexible in the timing of breeding. Sometimes they'll breed early, sometimes they'll wait and breed late. So across every aspect of their life history, they kind of roll with the punches, you know? Okay, this year we're breeding early, next year we'll breed late, whatever, there's no krill, we're gonna eat fish. And I think that that kind of flexibility allows them to adapt to the really extreme uh, changes that we're seeing on the Antarctic Peninsula. And I think that there are lessons, in fact, you know, for my own career and lessons that other people might take as well, which is that, you know, you might have had a plan, um, but if that plan's not working for you today, you know, you gotta go to plan B or, or plan C yeah. or plan D. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And recently you went on a trip with your PhD students. Uh, do you want to talk a little bit more about that? I'd love to. And, <laughs> and actually, I wish that I had been able to go with them. But, you know, as is oh. often the case with these big expeditions, mm -hmm. um, the person organizing it has to, you know, stay behind and, and try and orchestrate uh, from behind the scenes. But I am so lucky to have some of the most fantastic graduate students here at Stony Brook. And I had three of my graduate students down working with Greenpeace International mm -hmm. on a big survey of Adelie penguin colonies in the Weddell Sea, which is the cold and icy eastern side of the Antarctic Peninsula. So these areas are very rarely surveyed because they're very difficult to get to. But working with Greenpeace, we had a dedicated vessel that we could uh, move around the sea ice conditions and actually ended up being able to survey all of the target colonies that we'd been hoping to get to. And so you know, snatching uh, victory from the jaws of defeat uh, with Omicron. Uh, there was every possibility that this expedition would be canceled, but we managed to get the field teams in the field and they just got back this week. So um, a really uh, successful season and we're just starting to look into the data that they brought back. Uh, that's great. So um, if, if there was one message that you could get across to everybody in the world, what would it be and why? So the big question, you know, the, the, the you know, what I hope that they will, will come away with is that um, maybe you don't like penguins, you mm -hmm. know, maybe you don't like pandas, maybe you don't like polar bears. You know, I'm not going to convince you that you should, you should love the environment. Um, but climate change is going to come for us personally, like particularly thinking about Long Island when we think about sea level rise and hurricanes and forest fires, that just the services that the environment um, provides in terms of pollinating the very food that we eat, cleaning the air that we breathe, um, all of our food, all, everything that makes life possible uh, relies on a healthy environment. And so oftentimes I think we get distracted by, you know, thinking about saving, you know, the, the polar bears. And people say, well, I don't care about the polar bears. Um, but at the end of the day, it's not about saving the polar bears. It's really about saving ourselves. And I think that, that if people really um, saw that it's a win-win to protect the environment and they're pr protecting their own future communities, I think that they would realize what's at stake. And, and we're seeing that day in, day out with um, you know, the forest fires in, in California. There are parts of the US that will become uninhabitable. And to just let that happen, I think is, um, it's just, uh, you know, it's like shooting, shooting oneself in the foot. Yeah, it's, it's hard because some people, it's, it's hard for them to understand how the effects of, of the environment trickle down to us as a human beings. I think like right now we're so removed from the, the environment around us, living in the cities and such, that people don't really understand what's going on these days. Well, you'd think so, and you're, you, traditionally you've been right, but I think New York City is one of the most vulnerable um, cities that we have here in the US, certainly Miami and New York City. Mm -hmm. um, but we're looking at a scenario where we, would, we may have to abandon lower Manhattan. You know, we have to really think about whether we have to organize a managed retreat from uh, from these very populated, very densely uh, um, packed areas of New York City. And I, that is just so unimaginable that I don't think people can wrap their brains around it. But 
but that's something that we're going to have to to deal with so even pl in urban places where you think well i'm far away from the coral reefs that are uh -huh. dying and i'm far away from the polar bears that are dying um, climate change is going to come come for all of us uh, e whether you live in a city or not yeah th i think it's just really hard for us to grasp grasp what, what's going to happen because it's really in the future it's not happening now uh, well it is happening now but you can't really see it because it's in a bigger time scale than what we're used to. Right, and we tend to, to posit this as being one just of individual choice. Like obviously we all should be making good choices, you know, mm -hmm. we should all be flying less and we should be recycling more and we should be eating less red meat. All of those are important, but we should demand more of our, of our government, right? At some level yeah. we have to think about um, taxing carbon, we have to think about, um, you know, ending subsidies for fossil fuels. You know, these are big decisions that uh, we as individuals can't do alone, and I think there's been a push to make this all about us as individuals, you know what I mean, when really we actually just need to think at much broader scales if we're going to avert the worst of the, the climate catastrophe. That's true. Well, thank you so much for being with us today, Heather, and we'll see you guys next week. Oh, thank you.